We've been in this series called What Matters Most. What Matters Most. And I've been trying to slowly take us through this series to draw out certain aspects of what I believe matters most. When, when Jesus was asked, you know, what matters most? What's the greatest commandment? What was his answer to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? Once we love God, then there's this next step that he expects of us. And he says to love your neighbor as yourself, to love other people. That's the following step after salvation. And so once we receive him, what in the world are we doing as Christians? What is our purpose? What, what are we, what's expected of us? What were we gifted for? And that's to love our neighbors. And so we brought that out in the very first sermon and we talked about what matters most. And you will see that idea of family, this general idea of family throughout all of the Bible. And we looked at that through the story of the prodigal son, kind of an odd story story because it's a son that ran away, but it's also a story about a son that came back, right? And then it was a couple of obviously spoiled kids who had attitude problems, but in the end, it's about the family. Then we brought forth the example of spiritual family and how God actually transitions from the importance of blood family to something that's even more important, and that's your family of faith through the promise of Abraham confirmed by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. And then we looked at this a couple weeks ago, the new command that Jesus gave his disciples right before he went to the cross, and that was to love one another. Like it's been said, we're to love each other, and we can, or to love your neighbor. You continue to love your neighbor, but now you've got to understand there's just something that's a little more important than just loving your neighbor. It's that you got to love one another because this is about family. And then last week, we defined what it looked like to love one another when we talked about one anothering, one anothering. Does anybody remember what the Greek word that is one word for the two English words was? Alelon. Alelon. I always think like if you don't want another, you're going to be laying alone in the end. Alelon. It means to come together and, and serve one another in a sense. I ended, if you were here, with a visual representation of what I believe to be a 25-year-old biblical relationship between myself and Bob Jutla that was grounded through small groups. Today, I want to continue to drive home what I believe is God's priority. Everybody say his priority. God's priority for his people, with an emphasis on the gathering of believers, the assembling of ourselves together, the church, faith, community, God's own family meeting together in small groups. That wasn't just a list of things that Corey came up with. That was a list of things that are in the Bible. And so to continue from last Sunday, if we are to one another in order to fulfill Jesus' new commandment of loving one another, then how do we do that? How do we live out one anothering? The answer is together. Everyone say together. If we're going to look at the topic of together, we got to go back to the very beginning because I want to show you that this wasn't something new that Jesus implemented, but something that has always been. And when I say always been, it has always, 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 always been. From before the foundations of the earth, in all of eternity, was the idea, the topic, living out being together. You can go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and in the beginning, right? God begins to speak things into existence, and then he gets to this one special day, and he wants to make something that is a little bit more special than the rest, and God said, let us, everybody say us, make man in our own image according to our likeness now if you read the beginning of genesis you might have think singularly that there was one god that was creating everything but then you'll soon find out when it came to mankind there's a transition in what's being said it's no longer about a singular god who has all the power but it's about a god who is three in one 
God is together. He always has been together. And he is together three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a small group in and of itself from before the foundations of the earth. And so when you understand who the Godhead is, you'll understand that it's always been about togetherness. And so it's not surprising that when he creates mankind and he creates one man, that God would speak the importance of Adam being together in a small group. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good. Everybody say not good. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. You know what really interests me in this verse that maybe I didn't really think much about before? Do you know that when God spoke this, that it was before the fall of mankind? That means that it was before sin ever took place. So when we think of what is the one thing that is bad for mankind while they were still in the garden, you might think that it would be this tree. This tree is bad. This tree is sin. Do not touch it. Do not eat from it. You know, all of these things that that get said about it, even though he didn't say don't touch it. That was the devil right there. He says don't touch it. God said, don't eat from it, but you know that you best just stay away from that temptation. Like that's the one thing that could mess up all of mankind, and it eventually did mess up all of mankind. So when I think of what may have been the potential evil in the garden, the only bad thing that there would have been is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But before man ever fell, God looked at man alone, and he said, you know what? It's not good that man be alone. There was two things that weren't good. The tree of knowledge of good and evil and that man would be alone. And so he says, I'm going to make him a helper. Now, this passage, we know, you might be thinking, how could that be togetherness? Obviously, it's in the context of marriage. But I believe that it speaks to the fundamental need to connect with others in human community. It's often used, you know, in this sense, but really it's because God is representing, he's showing the ultimate representation of spiritual togetherness. He has created spiritual togetherness. In a sense, I believe that God said, this is who we are. This is who I am, the Godhead. This is my gift to humanity. It's the gift of himself to humankind. We and you become we. It was never meant for man to be alone. And so from the creation of Adam and Eve to the formation of his own chosen people, the Israelites, you will constantly see the priority of togetherness in a small gathering. You know, the Israelites, God chooses the Israelites. They come out of Egypt And they're gathering together. They follow after Moses. They got issues from the very beginning. And and Moses gets to a place. Moses, as righteous as he was, as close as he was to God, he gets to this place where he's like, God, your people. I can't handle them anymore. Take them. They're yours. It stressed him out. It's ruining him. And so there's this plan that is devised on how to divide things up throughout the family that God has chosen. I just want to read these. I'm going to read these quick. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 11 through 15, before they crossed over to the promised land, there was a reflection on what needed to take place for things to be healthy for the Israelites. It says, may the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are. That's the being fruitful and multiplying aspect of what God desires of us. And bless you as he promised. Say bless you. So there's a reminder of what God wanted his people to do. Multiply, be fruitful, grow, and this is the way that you will be blessed. This is, this is the promise that was to you. So how in the world are you going to grow and be blessed? Verse 12 
How can I alone bear your problems, your burdens, and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I'll make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, the thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, made them heads over you. Leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and the officers of your tribes. If Israel was going to continue to grow as a people and be blessed as God had promised, they had to learn how to deal with each other's burdens, bear one another's burdens. They had to learn how to deal with each other's issues, the struggles of life, and their hang-ups, which involved breaking people up into groups as small as 10. Still, the importance of togetherness came through small gatherings of believers. That was throughout all of their nationhood. And then Jesus. Jesus steps upon the scene. And as he begins his ministry to that nation of people, he says this, these words, Matthew 16, 18. He says, I say to you, that you are Peter. Now, mind you, in the context of this scripture, he asked them who he is, and Peter correctly answered who he is. You are the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You're the one to come. And he says, yeah, this came not from you, but from your father. And then he says, I say to you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In that statement, we see his goal And what was the goal of Jesus to build his, you don't want to say it because you're an individual, right? His goal wasn't to build a bunch of Lone Ranger Christians. But he stated his purpose to Peter right here. He has a goal, and that's to build his church, the gathering of believers, And so how does he do that? How does that start? The way that he starts it is by personally inviting a motley crew of odd individuals to gather together in a small group and do life with him. That's what he did. This is how we're going to launch this thing. I'm going to go over here, I'm going to ask this dude, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to ask him, I'm going to ask this person, and he seems a little crazy, I need him in my group, and I'm going to just go ask this guy, he rips people off for a living, I'm going to invite him into the group, and I get all these these people together, and that's my odd group of people that I am going to use to launch what history would know as the greatest movement upon the earth, called the church. Mark 3, 13 through 15, it says that Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those that he himself wanted. He chose them, and they came to him, and there he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. What I want us to see just a little bit this morning is that Jesus was literally surrounded by crowds just because of who he was, because of the things that he he was accomplishing that his people had never seen before, literally surrounded by crowds, but he connected. He joined together with only 12, just 12. Why? Why? Why would he connect with those 12? Well, we might think, well, it says it's out to preach and to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and all those types of things. But it wasn't just to preach, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons. There was a bigger picture. That was the works. But he didn't bring them in just to do works, but to be with him, to learn from him, to come to know him in an intimate way, and then that through being together with Jesus, the works would flow. Things would would come forth from them. They would see these things starting to take place in their lives. And so as they begin to do ministry with Jesus, what do we see? A bunch of individual personalities. However, they soon came to be identified by their togetherness. 
If you look in the scriptures, many times they're related to in the scriptures as, as the 12. The 12. Jesus called the 12 unto himself. The 12 were sent out. The 12 is often used. It's referencing the togetherness of the individuals. It was, it was a, a righteous group of men. Now, if you're a Seahawks fan, don't get any dumb ideas. Just because you're called the 12 doesn't mean anything in Jesus' eyes, all right? In the context of this small group, they would learn the practice of one anothering. And know this, the 12 weren't always the smartest, they weren't the wisest, uh, even the most righteous. In fact, a lot of times they said dumb things and they did dumb things. If we're being honest, if we were to go around and had the same options Jesus did, we probably wouldn't have picked those same people to be a part of our small group. And the truth is, if they were to have picked their own small group, they probably wouldn't have picked each other either. What you see is that they, they fought over position. They argued over who would be sitting at the right hand of God. They would, they would you know, want to call down fire from heaven to destroy a group of people. They, they would get mad and they would say things that they shouldn't say and they would doubt God. These were people who had a lot of issues. And our problem is this, that we want to join a faith community we want to connect with people only when we like most everyone there. We're willing to connect as long as there aren't any potential problems. Yeah, I know that person goes to that church. I would never go to that church. Any potential problems? I'm done. Any potential problems in that area? I'm done. We prefer to gather with people who are, what, similar to us. And so the challenge to our faith community is that we're called to like people who are not like us. You can look at the group that he gathers together. I want to give you two examples real quick. One of them, his name was Simon the Zealot. The other one was Matthew. So Jesus invites Simon the zealot. You got to know what a zealot was. He was kind of like a terrorist of his time. They were very zealous for what they believed, a political party. They would destroy anybody that was against their party that didn't believe the way that they believed. They couldn't stand the Romans. They were occupiers. They couldn't stand them because they were the governmental heads of their nation of people. They couldn't stand the Jews that would submit to the Romans. Why are you guys submitting? You should take a stand. Fight against the Romans. Why aren't you standing up for who we are, for our beliefs? That's the zealots. They did at one time later after Jesus died, and they all got crushed. The zealots fought back. The zealots were all, all about fighting, like, this is about who we are. This is about our faith. Let's destroy the Roman government and all those who are wicked and evil and against us and against what we believe. And you know what? Woe to those Jews who won't take a stand. And if you work for the Roman government, if you're something like a tax collector that takes money for the Roman government from your own people, like, we will put you to death. Simon, the zealot. I choose you to be a part of my, my small group. The extremist. You don't like any of these people. I understand your beliefs, how you want to kill tax collectors. Hey, Matthew. Matthew, maybe you could pause the tax collecting and follow me. Come be a part of my small group. I got a guy I want you to meet. Simon, the zealot. Jesus wasn't afraid of a little conflict. Jesus didn't want people who were all the same. He didn't want people who, who all had to think alike and act alike and respond alike. He wanted a range of people. You surround your people with just like you, birds of a feather flock together, that type of thing. You're never going to grow. 
Never want to be a part of something that might challenge you, cause conflict inside of you that might irritate you and bug you and cause you to question. You're not going to grow. Jesus needed to build something that would last. Something that, that was strong and fortified. And he wasn't going to do it with a, little, with a bunch of little John the Beloveds. Can you imagine a picture of the Last Supper and they're all trying to lay their head on Jesus? But a little awkward, right? A picture of 12 guys like this. Everybody gather around Jesus. Let's take a picture. John the Beloved was important. I'm not making fun of him. John the Beloved wrote amazing scripture. John the Beloved teaches us about how much God loves us. John the Beloved is, is a tremendous man of God. Vital to the group. But you couldn't have built a church on 12 John the Beloveds. Because the church would need to endure through everything. Now, here's the crazy thing. Who lived out of all the disciples? John. Jesus needed all sorts of different personalities. When he called the 12, he didn't find them already all in a group together and say, hey, I, I kind of like you guys' group. Will you follow after me? No. He called a bunch of individuals, and as individuals, they didn't even know who else was going to be in the group, but he called them together. And these two men, they're coming from completely different extremes, and yet being called into close, intimate fellowship with each other. It was no coincidence. It's the plan of God. He knew that within his kingdom, people would need to learn to connect, that the, that the 12 would become the foundation of the church. That's what scripture says about them. They were called together to learn to overcome prejudices and misconceptions and, and get over their differences. They were called together to learn to simply and humbly serve one another. Jesus wanted to do something inside of each one of them that would be lasting and expand. A lot of times we, we might think that when it came to the small group that Jesus had, it was all about them needing Jesus. And that's true. We all need Jesus. But do you know that Jesus needed them just as much as they needed him? We may not realize that sometimes. But God works through people. That's the way he's chose to work. He's chosen to work throughout all of history through people. And if you look, there were many a times that Jesus, he could have done things by himself, but he always invited them to come along with him. Probably one of the most grandest experiences was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And what does he do? He doesn't go alone. Like, do you really think he needed his three closest disciples to be with him when he was up there? Like, he went up there and he talked to Moses. Like, he's up there having a conversation. He didn't need anybody else to be there, but guess what happened? When he went there, he invited them to come along with him. He wanted them to be with him. He wanted his friends there. There were many a times he called them to gather around when the crowd wasn't around and you know that when he went to the cross, on the night that he went to the cross, John 13, 13 through 17, let me read this to you. Where am I at here? Right before going to the cross, he puts this lesson on display. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, talked about feet washing a little bit last Sunday, you ought to wash each other's feet. What? He's telling them they got to wash each other's feet. I just did it for you guys, and I want you to learn how to wash each other's feet. Wouldn't you be like, I could wash my own stinking feet. <laughs> Put 
but there's a greater lesson here. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to tell you. I tell you the truth that slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Jesus' final exam, in a sense, for his disciples, I believe was letting them know that through three and a half years, he was building a community a gathering of believers. He's been pouring into them. He spent time with them. Even when he didn't need to spend time, he spent time. And he didn't spend the last few minutes or moments teaching them how to do miracles. He didn't spend the last few moments teaching them how to get a breakthrough in life. He spent the last few moments of his life teaching them the importance of community the importance of learning what it means to truly humble yourself, take a position that's lower, and serve one another. When Jesus leaves that teaching, it says that he's struggling in the garden in the night before the crucifixion. He, he takes his disciples there in the garden, and what does he ask them to do? Wait here and pray. Did Jesus need his disciples? Absolutely. He was asking them to pray for him. I'm going to bring you guys with me, and I want you to just pray for me. Just take a little bit of time and pray for me right now. When he returned an hour later, they're all asleep. He's like, can you not pray for me? One hour? And then it happened again and again. Three times. He returned, and he asked them. The last time he was like, are you guys, you guys are still sleeping. Like, the only thing I really want from you is, is to be praying for me right now. Like, I need your prayers. I want your prayers. But, but, like, you couldn't pray for me. And then he's like, never mind. You know what? It's time. Here comes the betrayer, right? But what was his desire? What was his heart's desire? That his friends in his time of need would be praying for him. Don't you like to know that people are praying for you and standing with you in your crisis? And so did Jesus. Was it a need? Uh, even better, I believe it was a want. Jesus wanted them to be in his life. In the end, of course, it's a need because Jesus would need them to carry on what he was teaching them. Now listen, Jesus could have chosen any number of methods for his ministry, right? When it came to knowing that he was going to be leaving, he could have transferred his ministry to one person. I'm going to raise up a son in the faith. I'm going to pour most of my time into this one son in the faith, and that one person I'm going to train up so well that he will, when I pass on, take over the ministry, he could have refused all personal relationships and just concentrated on teaching the masses. He could have chose a different 12 once a year and that way when it came time for him to go away and the advancement of the church to take place that it would have been founded upon 36 that spent a year with him rather than just 12 who spent three years with him. He could have held classes for anybody to attend. Hey, you want to learn how to advance my church and my ministry upon the face of the earth? I'm holding a class this Saturday right after Sabbath hour ends. He could have done a lot of different ways to build his church. But the fact is that Jesus chose to bring a small group of people together as his primary strategy for building the church. After Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, what does he do? He gives his disciples some instructions. What were his instructions? Gather together until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so they gather together in the upper room. We know the story. The Holy Spirit falls, fills the disciples. Peter steps out. He preaches to the masses. 3,000 people become Christians that day. People had traveled from all over the world for this special feast. The feast of, of unleavened bread. That You know, they, they were there from all sorts of cities, nations, 3,000 people give their life to Jesus Christ. Same day, 
And you might think all 3,000 probably departed and went back to their own nation. I'm going to go back to Africa. I'm going to go back to whatever major city I came from. But what happened? It says in Acts chapter 2 that after they gave their lives to Christ, they didn't go home. They didn't go back to work. They didn't go back to life as usual. I I believe in Jesus. Now I'm just going to try and live a better life. You hear me? We've accepted Jesus Christ. Now we can go home. We can go back to work. We can go back to life as usual and just try to be better people. That's not what they did. It says they continued the plan of God that had started in the beginning, that Moses implemented through the Israelites, that Jesus modeled when he chose the 12 to be his disciples, and they gathered together in small groups from home to home. Listen to the launch of the church that I'll expand upon next week. Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. With many words, Peter testified and he exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is their teachings, fellowship with one another, the breaking of bread together, and in prayer with each other. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. Everybody say together. They had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. They studied the apostles' doctrine together. They had fellowship together. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They had all things in common together. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart together. They praised God together. There was obviously something special about the early church. This wasn't small group ministry. It wasn't the side thing that we do once a week. No, the gatherings were journeying through life together, literally They sold out for each other. What is mine is yours, and what is yours is is mine. When we spend time together, we talk about the goodness of our God, and we, we study his word, and we eat, and we fellowship together. And I can only imagine that the people who weren't a part of these gatherings, the gatherings of the believers called the church, that if you're from the outside, you probably were looking in, And watching them take care of each other, watching them love on one another and serve each other, watching them provide for each other, watching them do life together. And they knew them because if you have a love for one another, they'll know that you are his disciples. They knew them as Jesus' disciples. And it says the Lord added to the church daily because those people, I guarantee you, when they saw what was going on in this crazy, diverse group of people and the love that they had for each other, they were probably saying, I want to be a part of that. That's my prayer for us is that someday people will look at us and say, I want to be a part of that.